But I, th I think there are some key things that this uh, committee could do. The first one would be around having some joint committee sitting between the, this committee and the relevant committees around the, the scrutiny of the EU position on this and what Ireland's position is in relation to the European position. This might not be possible before September, but beyond September, this negotiation is going to, is going to be taking place right up until September of 2015. So there is still scope, once it goes into an intergovernmental negotiation, to, to engage uh, the government um, and relevant departments on this. But I, if possible, through some joint sittings or some process that involves more than, 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 than uh, the, the, this committee by itself, although that would also be very valuable. A second point that I would like to make is around Ireland's role in the Human Rights Council, and our membership of that council could be a really key strategic role in strengthening and sustaining the human rights language in the post-2015 framework. Um, it might be possible for this, um, this committee to engage with the Human Rights Unit and to encourage them um, to take up the issue of human rights within post-2015 in the Human Rights Council. And the third and final point is around um, the event in September and the importance of having some Oireachtas in, in representation um, in the, at the summit. And um, we were also talking to um, the Department of Foreign Affairs about having some civil society engagement. I feel that this is very important, given that the key negotiating positions are being decided at an EU level. And there is a danger in this process going forward that national level parliaments uh, could be left out of the, the, pro the negotiating process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for all your very interesting thoughts and uh, thought-provoking ideas. Obviously, some of them are simple, some of them are complicated, and uh, trying to cross, crisscross all the departments would be, would be, you know, would, would be difficult. But in theory, it's, it's possible, etc. Okay, Maureen O'Sullivan, there. I just read Maureen. Okay, okay. thank you, Maureen. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. And, and I want to acknowledge the work that all the NGOs do, not just the work on the ground, but also the policy papers that have come out because I think they've certainly challenged a lot of um, more traditional thinking on this topic. Um, I do believe that trade is a very considerable way out of aid. And when we look at the extent of the wealth in the developing world in oil and gas and minerals, um, and it's alarming is too mild of a word to put with um, what is being lost to the, the developing world. I think they could solve all our problems in the West if their act was, was, um, was done in a, in a much fairer way than it, than it has been. And we know about the tax avoidance and the tax evasion. And I think there's no doubt that what we're seeing is a new colonialism. And it's a, a new colonialism that, that is seeing trade agreements that are completely less than fair to the developing countries. And I think some of the reasons are the lack of the capacity of their governments to negotiate fairly. There's also the aspect of corruption for those governments who do negotiate, but they do it for themselves. I think there's a severe lack of parliamentary oversight. And um, even when new regimes come in and you expect much better things from new regimes, very quickly they fall into the, the old habits. And of course, obviously, the greater capacity of multinational companies to work systems, and we know that they are profit-driven, and whether it's from Europe or America or the Chinese, corporate interests are, are their god. So I think, I believe, policy coherence is going to be very difficult. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but I think a basic principle of countries being able to um, decide on their own economic policies, and we're not in the best position ourselves here to talk about that, but we could um, be an example of how not to do it that we can promote what's been called you know, economic democracy. I think the biofuels is a major one. And we can't give with one hand and take with the other. And I think there has to be a really, really stronger voice that at the very least we have the 5% and it doesn't go beyond that. I mean, I think it should be nil, but at least if we could do that. I think another one is labour rights. I don't think there's been enough emphasis on labour rights going into, in a binding way, into trade agreements. I think there is a need for support within communities, and I was at the, the conference, um, the Mary Robinson one, and there was just such um, 
tremendous voice from people who had come from all parts of, of the developing world. They know what to do, they know what they need, and they just need that extra capacity. And some of the things that they need that support on is very complex legal processes involving their land. And I, I think, again, is that something else that, that we can, can build in? And with my AWEPA hat on, we're starting our joint monitoring teams. And I do hope that this is something that we can bring to the two countries that we're starting with. Deputy Crow is, is involved in Tanzania. I will be in Mozambique. That what you've been saying here, that we'll take that with us and that it can be part of a, real, a very real and meaningful discussion with the politicians that we'll be meeting from those two countries. And I know some of you are coming to the AWEPA conference at the end of June. So again, we can engage the African parliamentarians when they are here and um, challenge maybe some of their thinking. So. Okay.